Hello and welcome to another edition of Cultural Conversations with the Big South. I'm your host, Darius Thigpen. We have Georgia on our mind this episode as a pair of student athletes who hail from the Peach State join us, a senior guard from the UNC Asheville women's basketball team. She's from Atlanta, had a record-setting performance with five three-pointers in the opening round of the Big South tournament last year. That sharpshooter is Tamia Lewis. Tamia, how are you doing? Good, and you? Doing really well. We're starting to get toward this cooler winter weather here in Florida. So kind of looking forward to the change in season. Now, our other Georgia native is from Morrow, Georgia. He's a speedster sophomore on the USC Upstate track team. He participates in what, in my mind, is the toughest event, the 400. And he's Chase Jarvis. Chase, how you doing? Wonderful. How about yourself? Oh, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, before we really get into it, guys, uh, I mean, it's obviously been uh, a bit of a talking point for everyone just all throughout. Uh, it's been a unique season, a, a unique year with coronavirus affecting everything. That's the reason why we're doing this Zoom call right now. Um, I mean, how are each of you guys kind of handling it? How are things going for you on campus? Um, personally, I can say that I am really astonished and amazed at how well UNC Asheville has done with handling the virus and all the precautions that we have taken. There's hand sanitizer everywhere, signs everywhere. Students and faculty are wearing masks and face shields and everything. And we're doing everything possible to make sure that we have minimal, almost zero amount of people contract the virus. So I'm really happy and proud to be a part of this university and see what we're doing. Yeah, I, I can say the same for uh, my university. Um, everywhere you go, signs on the doors say that if you don't come in, you can't have a mask. We have um, signs, uh, the readers that tell you that your temperature before you go into buildings. So the way that they're setting uh, things up at uh, USC Upstate is doing a very good job. Very good job. It was a historic moment in this country's history, um, as every election cycle is, but we saw record turnout this year in the middle of a pandemic, no less. So it was really a time where a lot of people were fired up for the election. And I gotta be honest, a lot of it had to do with people like the two of you, encouraging people to turn up and vote and encouraging people to exercise that right. So to me, I wanna start with you, 100% registered, 100% voted for the women's basketball team. So getting people to vote, that kind of seems like the thing that, that folks get to rally around every few years, but it doesn't seem like you were just worried about saying, hey, just show up and vote. You really wanted people to make sure that they understood who they were voting for, what they were voting for, what the issues were, paying attention to, to kind of everything. Um, and then of course, I mean, you, you framed it during um, a, a couple of different speeches that you've put on ahead of um, some of these social justice marches that you guys have done on campus that these things, uh, voting, were denied to people because of the color of their skin, because of their gender in the past. So it's a very important thing and a very important topic to get on. So to me, I just want to start with you. Um, when did you kind of get that sense of how important voting would be, not just for this election, but just for you overall when, in your lifetime? When did you kind of get into that? I would personally say during the nationwide quarantine, well, at least for Atlanta, we had quarantine period. So I spent a lot of time with my family and both my parents made sure to educate my brother and I about the importance of voting. I always grew up knowing that it was important to vote and knew that it was a right that a lot of our ancestors and those before us did not have. But I didn't know the importance of voting for other people besides the president. So my mother and father made sure to teach us and educate us on those who have other you know, jurisdiction and authority over our daily lives and legislation that aren't just the president of the United States. So during that time period, we did a lot of, you know, talking, reading, researching on, you know, who does what and how things work. And I made sure to share that information with my peers because it wouldn't have been wise of me or even, I guess, caring enough for others of me to not share the information with others to make sure that not only I have the information, but my peers also have the information. And Chase, for you, uh, voting, it was a big push, I mean, across all of the Big South schools. Um, so w when you look at how things were kind of organized and leading up to it, just this election, did that kind of feel like something on at USC Upstate's campus that was uh, really a special moment kind of kind of in history Did you kind of feel like like yeah we're in the middle of a, a big movement with this getting everyone well, registered and rallied and ready to vote most definitely it was a very big uh, issue well not issue but a very big standpoint um, especially around the youth at upstate 
Uh, most definitely, you can tell by the way that people spoke on Twitter. Uh, for the most part, a lot of people at Upstate do use Twitter. So with that, it was like every day we're just uh, people tweeting, like, make sure you guys register to vote. And then during those uh, time periods where you could vote, like early voting, you would have people posting their uh, stickers saying, hey, go vote, I already voted. So it was very a very big um, part of Upstate. Uh, we had to make sure that everybody went out and voted because this election was very important. Yeah, to me, I mean, you mentioned that very thing, like it, the importance of it uh, all the way back in August uh, after uh, James Blake, you, you, you talked about that in your speech that all of this showing up and being energized, it doesn't matter if you don't go vote. So I really do appreciate the fact that you said that. And I think um, a, a lot of that is, is kind of framed by what's been going on in the country recently and historically, of course. So for, the, for each of you, how did you end up voting? Because you're from Georgia, in the Carolinas. Uh, I think you have a similar experience to a number of student athletes uh, in a different state than where you live. So for each of you, uh, Tamia, how did you vote? I did an absentee ballot. It was my first time. And all I did was request it online through georgiavoters.org. And then they mailed it to me. I filled it out, signed it, mailed it back, express mail, because I wanted to make sure it was there ahead of time. And they, I checked my status online and they said they received it and it was approved. And for me, I, um, I went back home to vote. Uh, Clayton County was a very big part of uh, the Georgia election. So I had to make sure that I went back home and personally voted because I wanted to make sure that my vote counted. I mean, I can tell you, as a Florida resident, um, I, I've seen firsthand how important and how close an election can be. Uh, you go back to the 2000 election, it was decided by 538 votes here in the state of Florida, and that determined the election. Georgia was one of those very close states. So, I mean, did, you, did each of you t kind of take pride in that and saying, yeah, I made my mark on history. I got to say my piece in what really did end up mattering. Most definitely. Jordan County represented, that is where I live. <laughs> I'm extremely happy. Most definitely. I, I ended up making sure that my friends went out and voted too, so we could all make sure that we're giving that, the, I mean, showing these stickers and saying that we did make a, a change because a lot of us don't think that we actually have a voice and that our voice doesn't count, our vote doesn't count, but it definitely does. And you can see that by how close the election was. Well, Tamia, you did a fantastic job uh, with your speech back in August. Uh, just like Tamia, Chase, you are no stranger to speaking up and using your platform. Um, you are on the executive board for the Black Student Leaders at Upstate, and you spoke during the Be the Bridge March at USC Upstate. So that's where community leaders, both old and young, uh, came together, uh, including Al Atkins, who we've had on this program. And you spoke so eloquently about the importance of voting in our democracy giving the proper perspective to everything. Your message was certainly one of inclusion. Uh, so just kind of weaving in everything, including the narrative about um, being the bridge and then walking across the bridge as you all did. Uh, where did all of those words come from? Because that was a speech, when I listened to it, it sounded like some, something that was, I mean, wise beyond any of our years, to be honest with you. It, it was really well written. How did you come up with it? Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for that uh, compliment, but it, it just came from the heart. Um, when you look around and see that we are the United States of America, you, you have to start with United. So being that I am a black male, I have to understand that we have to move a little bit differently. So I have to understand that if I want to speak out, I have to speak to a point where they can understand what I'm saying. So I have to, to bring everyone together you have to be the bridge. So the words that I use came straight from my heart and I allowed my heart to write what I wrote. Now for that event itself, uh, how did it come to be and how did you uh, come to be involved with it so that you're up in front of a group of people ready to go on this march and you're speaking in front of them? How did that all come together? Um, my colleague, Maya, Maya Timberlake, she's a part of the women's basketball team. She reached out to me and she said, hey Chase, can you, write this speech and I said sure at first I thought it was just going to be a couple of words and then I spoke with my um, my advisor and she said you have to write an actual speech 
So after that, I began to, to put my heart to the paper. And that's how I became a part of Being the Bridge. Now, to me, uh, with yours back in August, uh, you go in, I mean, right from the beginning and you say their names. You go and start with that. And I mean, it's very powerful, your words. Was it kind of the similar thing for you where it was just speaking from the heart? Where did it come from for you? Literally off cuff. I didn't write anything. I just knew that I wanted to talk about voting because I knew that a lot of other speakers wanted to focus on you know, the experience of being an African-American woman or African-American male. And I didn't want to add more to that. I wanted to focus on a different aspect of how, you know, this is a powerful moment. And I wanted to use my stage to make sure that people knew that all of this, like you said, is great at the moment, showing out, wearing your black, supporting us, chanting their names. But it doesn't matter if we don't have legislative change. It doesn't matter if we don't have the right people in office. So I wanted to also bring home that point and make sure that they understood the importance of voting. So I just went up there, took the megaphone and said what I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and from the event that was organized at USC Upstate coming in from women's basketball player getting involved, for you yourself being a women's basketball player, I do want to kind of focus in on kind of what women's basketball overall has done in the social justice movement. Um, I mean, you look at the WNBA and what women's basketball in general has done, black women specifically carrying the load for a lot of these social justice pushes. Um, I mean, what is it about the sport, about black women that has led to so much activism and just energy behind it and really well organized with so many of these different events? Um, what has kind of led to how things have been put together by all these strong black women? And like you said, Black women, and I feel like that's the foundation and the root of all of this. As Black women, we are the backbone of our community and we, you know, nurture and care and educate our peers in each other. So when we see a time of need for African-American males and counterparts in, in need and help, we mobilize. And, you know, being that we're on a bigger stage, you know, Division One athletes or even for the WNBA professional athletes, we just use our stage and do what we've always been doing for years, which is supporting and showing up and being activists for what is right, which is social justice. So it's just another thing that I'm grateful for. And I'm grateful also for being a Division One athlete because we get to involve other women of, of color or even other women of different races. And then we all come together and stand up for what is right. So it's just a hand in hand combination of being an African-American woman and using our platform for what we believe in. Oh, absolutely. From Harriet Tubman all the way down to what we saw Maya Moore leaving the WNBA, mm -hmm. an MVP, saying, no, I'm going to leave to go and make sure that this man gets out of jail and fighting for his rights. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, un it's unbelievable to see it and just trying to articulate it all. Uh, it's sometimes even tough to put it into words. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, Chase, uh, I do want to come back to you for a second, though. Um, with your speech at the Be The Bridge, you mentioned that now is a time for uncomfortable conversations. So when it comes to those uncomfortable conversations, those difficult conversations, how often do they come about for you? Uh, whether it's with teammates, whether it's with friends, how often do those things come up just in kind of your day to day? Uncomfortable conversations come up a lot. Um, as a uh, black male, we have to stay together. Well, for, for my group. So I understand that we don't always want to talk about the things that are on our brains. So for me, I have a open door policy. So if I was to take that door and open it, I would say, hey, this door is open. You can walk through it at whatever time. It's a metaphor, but it's reality as well. So an uncomfortable conversation can be anything from racism to mental health because in our community we don't really um express the things that are going on in our brain so uncomfortable conversations need to happen so they do happen in my in, in my area so a lot <laughs> to answer your question well to me yeah. how often do you find yourself in the middle of those kinds of conversations well, currently a lot <laughs> because of the climate that we are in racially and politically. But now it's, it's calmer, but especially during 
the beginning of quarantine, March through now, it was every day, just an everyday thing. Uncomfortable conversations with my family, uncomfortable conversations with my teammates, with my coaching staff. And I was happy to have them because it's, it's a two-sided coin. Like Chase was saying, you know, as African-Americans, we do have to share our experiences with one another. And it's uncomfortable to do that with one another, but it also can be even more uncomfortable to share our experiences with individuals of other race. And then on the other side of the coin, it's uncomfortable for them to hear that or to see how they've contributed to that experience. But like Chase was saying, it is necessary. That's the only way we can truly become united people and see each other's perspectives and point of views is to have those conversations. So I've been enjoying it. I'm always down for a good debate and talk about things. So it's been a good time, but it's been a lot of healing and growth going on. Yeah, I, I definitely, um, I feel like the conversations that change the world are usually the most uncomfortable conversations. Not only because they have to do with change, but because a lot of people are scared to have those conversations. And fear, fear definitely drives us to not speak up about some things. So I definitely think that those conversations change the world. Really for each of you, have you always had that perspective or is that something that just kind of has come with age, l learning and understanding like, okay, I can lean into this conversation. It is gonna be a little weird, a little uncomfortable, but it's necessary. I personally feel like this is a thing that's really common in our generation. Mm -hmm. Knowing, let's going back to my parents' generation, some things you say, some things you don't, some things are taboo, some things are not. Mm -hmm. And then going back into my grandparents, a lot of things are not spoken about and a lot of things are taboo. So I think with each generation, you know, we've become more open to discussing things and saying, hey, this needs to change or, hey, we should talk about this or, hey, we should do that. And I think that's just growth that we've been doing as a nation. And I'm really proud of my generation of being in the forefront of that. I agree. Um, I can say that it came with age because at, as a child, you're told to stay in a child's place. And so as an adult, we grow up and now we have to change that. And we have to actually have those type of conversations. So with age, the time, not, not with age, with maturity, because you can be however old and still have a child mentality. So with maturity, that's when I began to grow um, older and start having those conversations about things that needed to be talked about. That's a part of the college experience, isn't it? Like learning and, and understanding that you need to keep asking questions and, you know, walking into a room and understanding, oh, I don't have all the answers. I do have quite a bit to learn. There's nothing quite as humbling as uh, going through like Chem 101 and realizing, ah, I don't know anything. Yes. And I think there's nothing wrong with asking questions. That's, um, that's what we, we were scared to ask questions. Like sometimes I would be like, mm, maybe I shouldn't ask that. But sometimes those questions that we shouldn't ask are the questions that need to be asked. Mm -hmm. So we can get the answers that we need. And that's really well said by both of you. So to me, uh, I do want to go to uh, another uncomfortable moment that's happened recently. So there was quite a bit of tension on your campus at UNC Asheville after the Black Lives Matter mural was unveiled. There was a threat that was made through email to the campus over the mural. FBI was involved in the investigation. Uh, yet, undeterred, at the end of the month, you and teammate Summer Diller made a video with the athletics department where you spoke about what Black Lives Matter means for each of you. Uh, so this is obviously, when you, when you compare the two things, a threat that has the FBI looking into it, mm -hmm. compared to you going and saying the very thing that kind of spurred on whoever made that threat to feel like they would do it, I mean, did you feel like you had to be brave in that moment? Or did you feel like, you know, I'm just saying the right thing and I'm not even worried about that other thing? Like, what kind of went through your mind just without, uh, throughout that month? Because that all happened in October. It did. It was the peaceful rally. Then the next week we made the mural. Then the following week was the thread. And then after that we made the video. So it was just back to back. Um, speaking about the rally, you know, in that moment was the most fear for my teammates and I because of everything that was happening with the shootings at other BLM rallies and protests. So we had fear in that. But seeing how supported my community, how much support my community had for my team and my university, I felt safe. I was like, I was reminded it's Asheville. You know, 
one of the hands down most liberal, liberal cities I've ever been in. And so we did the mural again, community support, but then we had that rude awakening with the threat. And I was, I said to myself, it is Asheville, but I still am in North Carolina. So it was a rude awakening and some of that fear did creep back in. I was again, proud of my university, my chancellor, my athletic director, the steps that they took to make sure to protect everyone involved in the mural and all the students involved. And I felt safe again because of the support that I had. I was even more proud and astonished that my university, you know, st stood by our side and refused to take down the mural, you know, even willing to put our safety at risk, which they didn't because of C the FBI was, you know, involved, but just saying that they knew how important this mural was to everyone. And so after that, even with the threat, I went into making the video with calm, collect confidence because I knew that I had the backing of my chancellor, my police force, everyone, family, friends, coaching staff, and I wasn't afraid. I had no more fear anymore. Nobody has any fear anymore on this university because we know that this is truly a safe place. And that's fantastic. I mean, you, you said it back in August that you said you never felt so proud to be a part of the university. And then the university went and backed you up even more in the face of that adversity in October. And what really what I'm kind of getting at is that it's not just black administration. It's not just black coaches. It was the entire community coming together, right? Mm -hmm. The whole, it was students at the rally, faculty, staff, regular civilians within the city at the rally. I don't know how the word got out that quick, but everyone was at the rally. And it was calm, truly calm and peaceful, which was amazing. I, I loved it. And I was just happy to be there and happy to be in that moment. And again, with the threat, student, I had faculty email me, or well, email everyone, but email me personally and say, you know, I'm so sorry this is happening. We're by you, we're standing by. Whoever did this is a terrible human being. It was just for them to reach out and send out mass emails to everyone and just let everybody know that they have our backs. It was a proud moment in a moment of fear and uncertainty. I was still comforted knowing that we're all in this together. That reminds me of, um, I didn't even think about, we had a protest in June or July, I believe. And it was organized by students. And so at the protest, before the protest began, uh, it was flyers that were sent out, like they were, people were boarding up like businesses and stuff. And we were like, why are you guys boarding up businesses? Really, this is like a peaceful protest. So during that time, like the students were getting kind of scared, kind of nervous because they didn't know like what was really going on. And it turned out that it was another, something else going down on the other side of town. And so when we had our rally, um, our march, uh, our actual police officers, the chief of police uh, for our campus, he was out there walking with us. And with that, it, was just, it just felt like a, a unified, that, that shows how unified Upstate really was. So that was one of the, the best parts of the protest that we had during the summer. It was just, it shows just like her university that we were unified and that they had our backs and it was pretty good. And Chase, you talked about, um, in our previous conversation off camera, we talked about how your police chief at USC Upstate has been really involved with a lot of these things that you guys have put together. Um, the BSL at Upstate, you guys put together a event called uh, Do We Have a Problem on uh, November 5th, earlier this month. School administrators, staff, and university police uh, chief spoke. Um, and it sounded like an event where you guys kind of just had this conversation, the uncomfortable conversation. Um, so how did your police chief factor in? Where did those conversations go? What, what was that event all about? So um, the Do We Have a Problem event was organized by the Black student leaders at my school. And basically, we wanted to talk about the things that we felt like were somewhat of an issue. So with that, uh, Clay Peterson, the police chief here at Upstate, did a wonderful job explaining to us how they pick officers that are have their our best interests at heart. So a lot of times police police academies just allow anyone to go through, but that's not the case with with us. So he did a wonderful job. He was he was a very um very good guest 
as I would say, he, he allowed us to have a, another blanket of security telling us that basically they were there for us. And anytime that we needed them, they would reach out or we could reach out to them and they would allow us to understand that they are for us and they are helping us to, to get around and do whatever we need to do. So with that, Clay Pearson, police chief here at Upstate, a wonderful man. He definitely, definitely. And that's really encouraging to hear as well. You, you also mentioned uh, before that uh, mental health was a big part of that conversation. Uh, so just in kind of the grand scheme of things, how important is that mental health conversation for you, especially during such a weird time in the world where we've got so many different things that only amplify uh, the stress and, and how people are depressed. Uh, mental health is such a big um, topic that we need to address right now. So, so how important is that for you? And, and how much of that, uh, that event that do we have a problem was mental health on that? Um, we had a whole section for that, that part, because I feel like um, opening up a little bit, um, depression is something that a lot of us do battle. Me speaking for myself, I do battle with depression. Uh, and, and this part of the year is the worst people experience. Well, now are experiencing COVID depression, um, seasonal depression, and just regular depression. And I feel like to have that conversation was very important. Um, like I said earlier, the open door policy. So knowing how I feel, I make sure that other people don't feel the same way. So to have someone to talk to whenever you need to, it's very important for me. So um, in that conversation in the town hall meeting, we were told, well, it was already established, but we were told that USC Upstate offers 100% free therapists. Um, so anytime you need to, you can schedule an appointment. Um, you go in and they actually had a depression screening and you can actually see like what was wrong and things like that. And so Upstate does a wonderful job, but it's just, they don't know. The students here don't really know about it. So in that meeting, we expressed that it is 100% free and everything is paid for by the university. So if you ever need help, then you can just go in and talk to somebody about it. And you can have an actual therapist and you sit and you talk with them about things that are going on and they do a wonderful job. They do a wonderful job, so. And by screen, you mean um, someone that was just there to be able to kind of help you diagnose and figure out, like ask you some questions, figure out, oh wait, you might actually be depressed. You may need help to kind yes. of like get them out of their shell, so to speak for that. Yes, pretty much. That's, um, yeah. I believe it was online. It was a survey. I can't okay. really remember. It was uh, about a year ago. So, but yeah, it's, it was definitely um, very helpful for a lot of students on campus. And so, yes. And that's incredible. And that's something that people should absolutely be encouraged by. And well, Tamia, you're working on something that people should absolutely be encouraged by. Uh, something special that you've been working on. So these coin bags, C-O-I-N bags that you've been making, um, caring for others in need. So your coach, Honey Brown, she tweeted out that you were involved in making these care packages with your own money. Uh, so tell us, how did you get involved with coin? What is it? Uh, what all is in these bags? Who's it helping? Like, what? yeah, tell us all about this. <laughs> so first off, I was raised in a... Christian-based humanitarian household. So we always gave back to our community through this company called Helping Hands, which helps people, you know, feed people through the city or just family and friends getting together and doing food lines for the homeless because, you know, a lot of people know that Atlanta and the city, there's a lot of the very dense population of homelessness. So I've always had an eye out for that. And that's something that's always been on my heart. You know, when I moved to Asheville, my freshman, sophomore, even junior year, I've realized that Asheville also has the same issue with downtown and going to other places on Tunnel Road, Patton Avenue, just homelessness. And of course there's homelessness everywhere, but I wanted to figure out a way that was tailored more towards my schedule and individuals who had similar schedules to me. I mean, student athlete, STEM major, basketball, very busy. I don't have a lot of time to devote to organizations where, you know, you spend two, three hours a day or on your weekend doing this and the third. So I wanted to, find a way to integrate, you know, 
giving back, but integrated into my schedule. So I came up with these care bags, uh, these coin bags, sorry, <laughs> care packages, coin bags. Mm -hmm. And within these coin bags, um, it's a bottle of water, toothbrush, toothpaste, and food. And I specifically wanted to focus on healthy food because I didn't want to be giving, you know, people things that I wouldn't want to put into my own body. So that's how I always go do unto others as you want them to do unto you. So nutritionist things like uh, grain, what grain bars, fruit bars, you know, muffins, jerky, protein, cheese, just things that I'm not saying it's going to be substantial enough to fulfill their diet or their, you know, hunger at the time, but just something to help taper it off and to get them throughout the day. Also, another important thing that I have in there are socks. People take for granted socks to keep your feet warm. And then also a list on the piece of paper that I printed out and researched in the city of Asheville of about five to 10 homeless shelters within the city limits with directions, a number to call, you know, hopefully they find a phone or someone to call or someone anything for them to get in contact with those homeless shelters, just trying to find a way to give them what they need at the moment, but also something that could help them later on. So that was the whole thought process behind these coin bags and just something I'm really passionate about because, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking to see those people out there in the cold and, you know, nobody out there supporting them. So I wanted to give back and help. them. And I, I do have a website for my organization or foundation or something. And um, it's www.c and then the, the number four, because the F is silent, but I need to do something cool. And <laughs> look at that link. C4OIN.com. Just with more information and how I put things together if anyone's interested in figuring, I mean, researching it and looking at it. <laughs> that is absolutely a wonderful thing that you're doing to help people really be able to get on their feet and get moving in the right direction. Uh, so Chase, coming back to you, uh, is there anything that you're working on or anything that uh, the Black Student Leadership uh, over at USC Upstate is working on that you kind of want to promote right now or talk about? Um, right now we're doing a sock drive. Um, so we're actually, like she said, we take socks for granted a lot. So. And do you have a, a web page or um, um, social media presence for the drive? USC BSL is our Instagram. And so with that, I'll probably be updating you guys on Instagram to make sure that you guys see like everything that's going on. All right, perfect. Well, you, you both are doing some fantastic work. Um, I mean, for me, I do have a shout out. I'm going to give it to the Black Play-by-Play -play grant. So it's a fund and a scholarship. Uh, it's an opportunity for Black college students and students who are just graduating and getting into the workforce to get a little boost into their broadcasting careers so that people who want to get into the art of play-by-play -play can have a little bit of uh, help getting through it financially. And it's also turning into a, uh, an opportunity for them to connect with professional broadcasters, black broadcasters, and get into a network uh, where they can find a number of people who can support them through their dreams of becoming professional broadcasters. And I really think that what the two of you are doing is just absolutely fantastic. Chase, Tamia, I really appreciate your time. You both have been excellent on this conversation tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. It's been a great time. A wonderful time. Well, you both have been excellent in bringing powerful words and setting a great example for what our Big South student athletes are. So thank you both. And viewers, thank you for joining us here on Cultural Conversations with the Big South. We will catch you next time. Thanks again.